All right, Family Law, this is the uh, week five guide. <clears throat> and as we discussed in week four, we're moving on to premarital agreements, kind of a continuation of, uh, you know, our post uh, cohabitation and Hewitt and all that progeny. So in this discussion, we will talk about the historical origins of premarital agreements and how the courts treat premarital agreements. Courts regularly had voided premarital agreements for the following reasons. The contract for property rights upon dissolution of marriage or death was contrary to the concept of marriage. You know, um, you, I love you, I love you, I love you until death do us part, blah, blah, blah. You know, having an agreement that says in the event that we ever split up, that's kind of contrary to the, that whole, um, religious and public policy and traditional concept of marriage, right? Uh, concerns that the courts would, you know, have to deal with premarital agreements. It caused the institution of marriage to lose its dignity and sacredness. And um, that was a concern. There was also a concern that the courts would be mired down in ceaseless minor litigation. Um, and probably the reality is that if we had some requirement that you had a premarital agreement when you entered into the contract of marriage and you know got your, um, <laughs> your marriage license and went through all that process that we've explored, that you also presented a, a premarital agreement. I don't know, uh, maybe that would save the court some some of that, but, and then concerns that enforcement would be um, something that led wives to be impoverished, to leave them dependent on the state for support. So that was historically. There's also concern that allowing premarital agreements would encourage the property owning spouse, usually at the time the husband to abandon the marriage um, partner, usually the wife. There are fears that enforcement would make spouses, usually the wife, endure a bad marriage, conditions uh, that they shouldn't have to endure for fear of losing all material possessions. And there was a belief that use and enforcement of premarital agreements would usurp the traditional function of the equity court to settle divorce rights. So that's historically why we didn't have them. Today we have them. And today, they're not just for the rich and famous. Um, so some common reasons why uh, we see people seeking these agreements. You have couples that have disparate amounts of, of wealth. You also have couples that have um, the same problem with debt. One has a lot more than the other in debt or wealth. One party doesn't work. Uh, maybe one party has children from a prior marriage, and so expectations of their property going to those children. Um, maybe someone in, of the two or both have been through a contentious divorce before. It could be that at least one party owns an interest in the family business. A lot of times family businesses, uh, the family will ask for a prenup to avoid those who aren't part of that marital agreement or that marriage from being mired down in or having to pay for the bad choices of one of those people. And they decide to get divorced or whatever that they don't want the whole family business to blow up or all of their interests to blow up because the marriage of one of the owners, a family member had blown up. Um, sometimes it's based on someone having an anticipation of an inheritance, some large amount of money that's going to come into their, uh, their lives at some point. Um, premarital agreements may be advocated by the spouse with more money, a spouse looking to protect the rights of his or her children from prior marriage, or parents of the couple contemplating the marriage. Parents are most often the driving force behind a premarital agreement in first marriages, the parent wants to ensure that the parent's inheritance to the child or family business isn't subject to claims. Um, and so they, they get involved. 
why do people avoid this type of agreement? It's contrary to the ingrained social customs and religious beliefs about marriage. Again, till death do us part. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. You know, stay together forever. It's socially ingrained, religious ingrained. Um, and it, that's having a premarital agreement that essentially says if we get uh, divorced, kind of goes contrary to that expectation or those traditions. Um, the use of the premarital agreement voices doubt about the relationship. Again, that's a more of an emotional thing based on, again, probably some of those social customs or beliefs or, or norms, right? Um, requiring a premarital agreement shows compromised devotion. Maybe that's true. I don't know. But that's one of the reasons. And the cost involved of having both parties represented by separate counsel, because they should be represented by separate counsel, the negotiating and drafting of a comprehensive ex uh, agreement might be extensive. So I guess it depends on how much property you have or what your risks are, or what your, your fears may be in the event that that circumstance that probably nobody goes into a marriage thinking they'll end up in. Um, that it might happen. To have that agreement be enforceable, there must be an offer and acceptance. It's a contract. And if you don't recall the elements of a contract, there's an offer and an acceptance. The contract must be supported by consideration. The parties must have the capacity to enter into the contract. The subject matter of the agreement cannot be illegal. Okay, those are requirements. You have to excuse my dog, the UPS guy came. Challenges um, to these agreements after the fact are typically going to allege some type of attack or lack of fairness at the time the agreement was entered into. So there was some sort of unfairness at the time the agreement was entered into. And that's gonna be the allega allegation. Now there's two types of unfairness that will be alleged. The first is procedural unfairness. And that's when the court reviews the agreement for evidence of unfairness in the process of negotiating the agreement. Typically with these types of agreements, that allegation would be um, something to the effect of you know, one party didn't have the resources that the other party had to get a good lawyer or the same caliber lawyer to review the agreement. Um, it could have to do with the timing. You know, it's the night before the, the wedding and just after the rehearsal dinner and your soon to be spouse says, hey, I love you, I love you, I love you. I want you to sign this prenup agreement or we can't go through with the wedding might cause the court to think that it was procedurally unfair. Substantive um, fairness is when the court reviews the agreement for evidence of unfairness in the resulting terms of the agreement. So the, the terms of the agreement are so unfair on their face or for whatever reason that that's the allegation. It's not the procedure. The procedure didn't wasn't patently or didn't appear to be unfair. It's the substance of the contract of the agreement appears to be unfair. So somebody is worth $57 billion and the person that uh, has signed the agreement is going to get, or after the divorce, $500,000. That would seem to be unfair. It depends on a lot of factors, but it just would seem to be unfair. Most states, including Illinois, have adopted the Uniform Premarital Agreement Act. If you don't remember what uniform acts are, if you've had legal research, shame on you, go review. If you haven't had legal research, um, there are a number of acts that are put or are formed by committee, multi-state national committees, experts in that particular area of the law who come together to try to have this model code or this model law that states can adopt that allows for some uniformity or some um, uh, some consistency across states. It's very valuable. 
to have this, especially when you consider that many people move from state to state. So having an agreement enforceable based on where they live, um, you know, they move from Illinois and they have an Illinois agreement and they go to another state and that state follows the Uniform Premarital Agreement Act, it's helpful. It says that agreements are presumed to be valid and enforceable and the burden is on the party challenging the agreement to prove that either one party did not enter the agreement voluntarily or the agreement was unconscionable at the time of execution. So substantive and procedural, or procedural and substantive in that order, um, unfairness. The agreement has to be in writing and signed by both parties, okay? It can't be a handshake. The content should include the rights and obligations of each party, the disposition of property upon separation, death, or occurrence of any other event that's listed, the rights with regard to spousal support, aka maintenance, the making of other estate planning documents to carry out the provisions of the agreement, dispositions of benefits from life insurance policies, a choice of law, what law is this going to be enforced and any other matter not in violation of public policy or criminal statute. Seems consistent with some of our other family law requirements, right? And note, the parties can't contract with respect to the right of a child to support from either parent. In other words, child support can't be adversely affected by this agreement. The courts won't even consider this, okay? Support or custody. There's a list of definitions as with most of our statutes and you can read those definitions. You're supposed to have gone to the ICL to try to figure this out. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's an area that's growing. It's probably something you're gonna get into. Um, you need to know where those resources are. If you get into drafting these agreements, Pay attention to the fact that it is an agreement. It has the same requirements of any contract. It is more complicated than most contracts. Um, and it's not something you want to dabble in. So rely on somebody who's done this a few times until you get to be familiar with it. And whoever you're working for, hopefully that lawyer is going to do the same thing. It's our week five guide. Stay safe. I'll see you in class.